Hello? Hello. All right, great. Uh, my name is Chase Douglas. I'm an engineer on the browser team at New Relic, uh, which you may have heard. We just released a lot of awesome new features. Uh, I suggest you should hit us up at the, uh, the booth after this. Uh, but today I'm going to tell you about a couple of things that I find interesting uh, about how JavaScript runtime engines work. So just a brief overview. Um, stand on my soapbox for one minute about when to optimize. Most people have a good idea, uh, but I'll just reiterate because later on I'm going to talk about not only how JavaScript engines execute code, but how one can write code to be more optimal. So I'll get into object specifications, function optimizations, and lastly, primitives. Uh, and at last, a, a little footnote. Uh, I'm not actually a JavaScript runtime compiler engineer. Um, I only stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night and read some blogs. Um, uh, but uh, so with that, a lot of what I understand comes from uh, the V8 um, and a little bit of the, the Spider Monkey and JavaScript core uh, engines behind some of the browsers. Uh, and that depends a lot on uh, what documentation is available. So uh, if you happen to be a JavaScript compiler engineer, uh, and uh, especially if you work on uh, an engine that may not come up much, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, and I hope that I get things right for you as well. Um, so. First, when should I worry about optimizations? Uh, the, the general gist is what a lot of people understand. Optimize your hot code, the stuff that you know is executed a lot and that can benefit from speed ups. If an SQL query takes 20 seconds for every page load, that's obviously a problem. Uh, but if you've got something that takes you know, an extra second but is executed once a month, uh, doesn't really make sense to, to optimize that too much. Uh, and this is an, an interesting topic because when we talk about browsers, in the past, we've always dealt with relatively small amounts of JavaScript where it's some state manipulation of some elements and objects on the page. And optimizations in, in that context really aren't necessary at all. But we're getting to the point with some of our more complicated uh, and, and complex uh, browser frameworks like AngularJS and Ember, where optimizing JavaScript code can be very useful. If you've ever written an Angular ng repeat directive over an array of just 100 items that generates a bunch of divs, you might have noticed that it can take a couple seconds to run that on a netbook. So it's becoming more and more important. Uh, and people who use Node.js on the server, obviously, they can care a lot about how quickly their code executes, especially with very high throughput servers, beacon type servers. Uh, so don't run in and, and modify all your code just to conform to uh, ways that JavaScript compilers execute code. But this can, some of the things that we'll talk about can be useful for your very hot code paths. So first, object specifications. Um, this is some assembly code in x86-64 for how you address some primitives and, and objects, uh, property values. And so I'm going to go line by line through this so that you can, uh, I hope you can read that in the back. Um, actually, no, uh, I, I wanted to make this talk no assembly required. Uh, it's very important to me that uh, sometimes how language is run, how they execute in a processor, when you research it, you start to dive into assembly code and, and uh, byte code of the language. And that can be very difficult to parse. But really, most optimizations and, and how compilers work, they can be conceptualized. They're, they're often how you and I might think a compiler would work and might be faster under certain scenarios. So you don't actually need to be a compiler engineer, need to know assembly code or byte code to be able to understand how, how your JavaScript code executes inside of a computer. 
So with that, let's start looking at objects. Here we've got an object that is a very simple instantiation of uh, what is effectively a hash map. A hash map that maps uh, a property name to a value. In this case, we've got strings mapping to string, strings. And in JavaScript, uh, property uh, key pairs, uh, the keys to, to access the values, we know that they must be strings. That keeps it very nice and simple. So properties and values are stored as a hash, hash map. It's a very fundamental concept. We see this in, in all kinds of uh, languages. So what does it mean to store it in a hash map? And how, how do objects get, the, the values of properties in objects get looked up? Well, diving into just a little bit of a high-level overview of data structures, this is, in general, how a hash map lookup works. You've got some property name, uh, a key, which in JavaScript must be a string value. So you've got this string value, and you pass it into this hashing function. And what comes out of a hashing function is an integer. It's actually a location of an array. And so then you look inside of this array, and you can pluck out the value that maps to that property name that you passed in. So it's a very efficient way of going from a property name and finding a value, uh, especially as compared to just keeping a long list of properties. You have to iterate through one by one to find the one that you care about. So it's, it's pretty efficient. There's a couple steps involved. But actually, there's, there's some, some hidden stuff behind this, because what happens if you pass two different property names in, and this hashing function gives you the same index into your array. Well, you obviously can't store two different values for two different properties in the same location in the array. So we have to do something else. One way you can deal with this is that you can create what's called linked lists for each location in that array. So here, if you've got two properties with, that map to the same index in your array, you can go and iterate through the list to find the actual property that you care about. So this is great. It's, it's, it's efficient. Uh, it's a very efficient way of storing properties and values. But there are a few steps involved. You have to you know, pass in, go through a hashing function, look up in an array, then go through a linked list. So let's look at the other way that we can store values in an object. Here we've got an array. It's very simple. It's got three values in it, indexed at 0, 1, and 2. And these get mapped to linear locations in memory. So it's very easy to look them up. You just, you know, you want the second element, you just find your array in memory, and then you shift down to memory locations, and you pluck out the value. So that's great, but there's a caveat. So uh, I don't know if you can see it there. It's a little asterisk. Um, well, I, I guess I'll spell it out. Uh, we got sparse arrays. So let's say that we take our regular array that we were looking at. It's got three values at index 0, 1, and 2. But then let's throw a curveball at it. Let's say, OK, let's, let's store a string at location 1 million. So what, what are we going to do with that? Well, let's say that we store all of this in linear locations in the memory. We would have to continue to enlarge this array so that it can hold a million values. Well, on 64-bit computers, where we might have to store objects that you reference through memory addresses, that means that every element must be eight kilobyte, or sorry, eight bytes in size. So if you've got a million elements of eight byte size, you're talking about eight megabytes in memory that you've reserved for only four values. So if you've got a lot of these arrays around, you're just wasting a ton of memory. So JavaScript runtimes, they recognize this, and they say, you've just added an element that is so far apart from all the previous elements I got to do something special here to, to compress our memory usage. So what it does is it goes back to our hash map. It says, well, instead of using 
strings as property names, we can give it integers as array indices. So this is great. It allows us to have arbitrary indices into our array. But what it also means is that we have reduced our performance from a simple array lookup in memory and then add however many indexes, uh, whatever index you're looking at, and pluck out the value there. Now we have to, again, go through our, our hash function, our array lookup, our linked list traversal to find the right value. So let's step back now, though, and talk about JavaScript objects holistically. So an object can have both, at the same time, an array and properties. So how, how can we store that? Well, what the JavaScript runtime does is it creates a spot in memory that holds both an array and a hash map of properties. So that's great. Now we can access things. Um, but again, I'm kind of hammering on this point that, that hash maps stink. Um, when I want to really quickly access different properties, there's a penalty. It's not that great, but if you're in you know, extremely hot code, there's a penalty of having to go through a hash map. So what if I want arbitrary properties, but I don't want the overhead of a hash map? Well, again, do you really care? So getting back to when should I optimize, is this, is this really hitting hot code pads? in your high-throughput beacon server. Because if it's not, then you really shouldn't care. But if it is, if you really need to eke out the last little bit of performance on your servers or in your browser, there's actually something we can do. This is where JavaScript classes come in. It's kind of an interesting concept. How can classes in JavaScript help us optimize the performance of our object's accesses? So let's look at JavaScript classes. Here, we, the way you define a JavaScript class is you create a function, and you just give it the name that you want your class to be named. So we define a class here called myClass, and that function is your initializer, your constructor, for your, uh, all of the, the insta instances of your objects. So we've got an initializer that sets two properties, x and y, on our objects. Well, now we come down, we create an instance of this object, and you know I, I promise that uh, classes can help speed up how you access properties on your objects. So how does that work? What, what information do we have here that we didn't have before? Well, let's say that you've got an access to myobj.x. Well, behind the scenes, in your JavaScript engine, it can keep track of what types objects are. So it says, well, I know that this is a, a my class type of object. So with a my class object, instead of storing the properties x and y in a hash map, I can instead put them in specific locations. And the reason that I know I can do this is because every time a my class object is instantiated, we know from the code that the x and the y properties are going to be initialized. So the, the engine's pretty smart about this, and, and here we've gotten down to where you just look up a specific location in memory rather than having to go through a hashing function and a linked list and, and, and so on. So this is great. But there's a catch. So this is JavaScript, and you've got objects, and uh, this is not a big statically typed language like Java or C++. We can add properties willy-nilly. So Let's take our same class and, and object instantiation, and let's add a property to it, uh, a new one called Z. What are we going to do here? Because we reserve specific places in memory for X and Y, and now we've got a Z value. We don't have a spot to put that. 
if we tried to look it up on a my class object, we'd be a bit confused. So what can we do? Well, we can just add it. Why not? We have spots for X, Y, and Z. Uh, and any time we look at this type of object, we, we know X, Y, and Z. But if we were to try and look up Z on an object that was a my class before we put a Z on it, well, then we might be looking at the, the wrong place. We might be looking at maybe what, where the array is, not knowing that this object doesn't have a Z. So what really happens in your JavaScript engine is it keeps track of the fact that this is not the same as a, as a traditional my class. This is like a my class star. So it's like, I, this, this feels wonky. It's different. And I got to keep track of that. All right, so this is very important, but I'm going to have to come back to it in a minute. And I'm going to move on to function optimizations. So we got a little bit of code up here. We've got two variables to find. One is an array, and one is a string. And we define a very simple function called getLength that takes an argument and returns the length of the variable that was passed in. And then we call it a bunch of times. We call it five times in a row on variable A, which is an array. And we call it once on variable B, which is a string. Now, what I'm going to demonstrate here actually would not be demonstrable in a, in a real optimizing engine because it would, it would do something called function inlining. It would say, well, that's such a simple function that I'm going to take all the invocations of get length and I'm just going to replace it with variable dot length and be done with it. And in fact, even beyond that, it would realize that, well, no one's using what I returned from get length, so I'm just going to like drop all these invocations altogether. But let's assume it's not that smart, but it's still somewhat smart. Let's step through the invocations of get length. So when we call it the first time, it's going to pass a into the function get length. And it's going to say, okay, well, we need to call the length function on A. But the length function for, say, an array is very different than what it is for a string. For a string, we have to count up how many uh, characters are in the string. Whereas for an array, we have to count up how many elements are in it. So we first have to find out, okay, what type of, of variable were we passed in? All right, so we passed in A, so it's, a, it's an array. And then the engine has to go and say, okay, let's go find the length function for an array. All right, here it is. It's over here in memory. All right, let's call it and let's return it. So we called it return five. All right, we get to the next line. We call get length of A again. And it goes in and it says, okay, well, what is A? Well, again, it's an array. So it's like, all right, I got to go find the length function for an array. Okay, it's over here. Now we'll call it. We'll return five. Great. By the time we get down to the, the third invocation, the engine's starting to, starting to, to, to catch on to something. And it's like, I, I, I see what you're doing. I, I, can, I got this. I can optimize this because you're always passing in an array, and I'm always having to go and fetch the length method for an array. So I, I'm just going to assume that you're passing in an array and I'm going to keep around this length method, and then I can you know, get rid of a step where I have to look up which method to use. So when you call it here, it can easily use the length method that it has sitting around, and it returns the value 5. Great. We do it two more times, and we save some time. We're, we're really cooking now. And now we pass in get length of b. Well, this is odd. It, it says uh, you're passing in a string. Now, a string's not an array, and I can't use the array length function for a string. So what it actually has when it optimizes is it adds a little check into the code just to assert, yes, I'm in, I'm, I've been passed in on an array. Everything's good. All my assumptions are safe. But when that assert fails, it says, whoa, whoa there. 
we we got to do so we got to deopt short for deoptimize so if you go around you look up your your javascript uh blog post and you come across deopt that's what's going on here we had an optimization but then we broke the assumptions and we're back to square one it it realizes well i'm not passing an array so i'm just going to go have to go back and ask you again okay what type are you All right, well b was passed in, it's a string. So I got to look up the length method for a string. All right, so then we call the length method for a string and return 5. So run times can be great at optimizing, but especially so when you pass the same object type into a function. So let's say you have a million elements all of the same type in an array and you're iterating through them and you call the same function on them you're going to get a large optimization because you're using the same types but if you insert halfway through the array a different type you're going to hit a deopt and you're going to harm the optimizations as you go forward through that array Now most engines are then going to notice well okay you're already you're always passing in one of two values so I can optimize for two values but you still have harmed yourself a little bit so you could do some things you could uh reorder the elements in your array so that you always hit a different type uh at the end you could call different functions with different names so that the two different functions are always called with different types So uh polythe sorry I always screw this up. Uh polymorphism is bad. Uh as I was saying you always want to send the same types into functions and that's what's called uh calling it monomorphically. But if you remember when I talked about my class and my class star the only difference was that my class star after it was created we added another property to it property z but because we have to access it in memory differently the javascript engine has to treat it as two different types even though it's the same javascript class underneath so that's harmful uh be careful all right primitives the last thing that i find really interesting So let's talk about objects versus primitives. Objects are pieces of, you know, values. We've been talking about objects. They're stored in memory and you access them like if you have var a is an object. You a, a holds a location in memory. So you want to get a property, you got to go property of a. You have to go get the location in memory of that object. Then you have to go and find other things. There's a level of indirection involved. But when we talk about primitives, those are stored directly in memory. So, uh the variable a might hold the number 2. And it's not holding a pointer to the number to to a place in memory where the number 2 is held. It's actually holding the number 2. So there's a faster access involved. So in JavaScript, we've got strings, booleans, and numbers sometimes that are stored as primitives and are very fast to access but all of these are actually sometimes so you can actually do something called boxing primitives where you can turn a primitive into an object so let's say you've got a string variable a you've stored a, a literal string into it that's that's a nice primitive very quick access But then you add a property because this is JavaScript you can add a property to everything. You add a property to your string. And now it's not so simple because not only does it have this this value that is this this string primitive. It's also got a property on it. So we have to keep track of both of these things which means we can't just store it in one directly in one piece of memory. we have to add our level of indirection to be able to store a memory address that points to the object that has the string primitive and the number and the the properties so the takeaway here is to be kind to your primitives and not box them uh to improve performance <laughs>
now let's talk about those numbers, which I said are sometimes boxed. So in JavaScript, all numbers are floating point double precision values. Even if you see, you, you print out a number and it just prints a, an integer without a decimal point, it's still a floating point value. It's just that your logging routine is, is smart. Double precision floating point values, they're very precise. They can hold 53 bits of information about your number. So if you've got a 64-bit system, the bottom, the lower 53 bits holds the value of your number, and the upper 11 bits must be zero. If any of those bits are one, it's an invalid floating point number, or in other, in other words, uh, NAN, or not a number. Now, interestingly enough, if you've got a 64-bit machine, it can't actually address 64 bits worth of memory. The x86-64 spec only allows you to address up to 48 bits of memory, which should last us another two or three years. Um, that was a joke, by the way. Ha ha. Um, math tells us that 2 to the 64 minus 2 to the 48 is greater than 2 to the 53. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is that we can actually fit both floating point numbers and objects, po or pointers and memory to objects, side by side. Not in the same spot, but we can, dis we can differentiate between them. So let's, let's look at how you do this. This is called NAND boxing. So when you have a memory pointer to an object, you store it normally as upper bits are zero, lower 48 bits is the location in memory. But then when you're storing a floating point value, you store your lower 53 bits, but you set the upper 11 bits to something like all ones. And then when we come across a value, like a variable A points to some value, we can tell if it's preceded by ones, then it's a floating point number. If it's preceded by zeros, then it's got to be a, a, a location in memory that points to an object. So this is used in Safari, uh, an older opera. In fact, it actually came uh, from JavaScript Core, which was the runtime engine in uh, Conqueror, the KDE browser, uh, a long time ago. Um, and so there's some disputes between whether Opera or Conqueror had it first, but uh, Conqueror uh, got to, to stick the flag in the ground and call it NAN boxing, which led to NUN boxing. Uh, I'm not making that up. Um, Firefox, the people who brought you the name Spider Monkey, decided to uh, name their inversion NUN boxing. Uh, so here, we just flip the representation around. Uh, if you have a memory address, you're going to precede it with a bunch of ones. And if you have a floating point number, you're going to store it as you normally would by proceeding with, with zeros. Why you would choose one way or the other probably depends more on what you expect to be accessing more frequently. Objects with memory locations or floating point numbers. Because you have to take the one that you're putting the ones in front of and you have to recognize that and then perform a bit mask before you can actually access and use it directly. So Firefox, they decided to go with none boxing. What about V8, which is the engine in Chrome? Well, they have this cool thing called crankshaft. And crankshaft has a lot of facets. It's basically a large part of their uh, optimizations in their engine. But one part of it it deals with how they can access primitive values. And generally what they do without getting into specifics is they try to understand the code and figure out where it's accessing numbers and strings and booleans and where it's accessing objects. And it predicts that. And then it, instead of loading up the memory addresses that might point to those primitives into CPU registers and, and uh, stack locations on the memory, it 
loads, it, it does some uh, type inference where it makes some assumptions and it loads those directly, those values directly without having to keep them unboxed in memory. So with that, um, I just want to point out some credits. Uh, uh, I really highly recommend checking out uh, Mr. Aleph and Andy Wingo, uh, where they blog about JavaScript uh, runtime uh, optimizations and engines. Uh, and uh, thank you. Uh, I invite you to come and see uh, me and all of the, the New Relic gang at our booth uh, next door. Uh, and um, thanks. <laughs>